By the 1920s, making movies was the fifth biggest business in America and about to become bigger. 1921 was an all-time record year for Hollywood studios. They produced 854 features. By 1922, nearly 40% of Americans went to a picture show every week. The development of movies from just images of things happening um, without editing moved pretty quickly. Within a decade, I mean, you had the studio system and the whole thing was working. It must have been a very exciting time at that point because it was an industry being born. There was great experimentation going on, great vitality. It was a land of gamblers, really. These early founders were showmen. They were Barnum and Bailey kind of guys. You know, they throw the dice out there and, and they let it fly. I think initially they were all trying to build their own companies. And I do think that because they all came from the same kind of background, moving here as immigrants from Eastern Europe, to a large extent, most of them were Jewish. Sharing that kind of tradition, they all depended on each other in some ways, but were always trying to step on each other to get ahead. The press began to refer to Hollywood's founders, many of them immigrants, as moguls, a term that suggested East Indian Rajas with infinite power and ambition. Well, that title didn't seem particularly flattering, but it didn't stop those movie moguls from forging on to grab even stronger footholds in the movie business. Some of them started off in these penny arcades. Other people started off in making movies. Others started off in distributing them. As they get successful in one end, they move into the second end and into the third end until they get all the profits. Today, it's called vertical integration. Gaining control of story creation, stars, studios, and local theaters, the movie entrepreneurs also reached outward, creating webs of communications interconnections. One of the first men to make intermedia links wasn't a scrappy immigrant entrepreneur. He was newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst. Hearst had parlayed a mining inheritance into one of the world's largest fortunes. Hearst was the biggest newspaper magazine publisher in the United States. So anything to do with that, the general field of communication, Hearst would be in on. Hearst actually is an unsung hero in the film industry. People do not realize that Hearst is one of the very first film companies in the United States. He was able to test out the success of a story by its popularity in a magazine. And then he could just turn it around and sell it to himself to make a movie out of it. Hearst created a pioneering movie newsreel company and turned his newspaper comic strip characters into animated cartoons. By 1919, William Randolph Hearst's interest in the movies was more than professional. He began a lifelong affair with actress Marion Davies. Marion Davies was a very talented comedian. She was a very accomplished actress in many ways. She did not take herself at all seriously. And I think that was incredibly refreshing to Hearst. She loved Pops, as she called him. It's often said that the movies is a business of relationships in more ways than one. While William Randolph Hearst was mixing business and pleasure with Marion Davies, during the 1920s, the movie moguls were focused on building studios, acquiring theaters, and expanding their power. 
With Hearst spreading the news, the 1920s was the first great era of advertising and mass media heroes. A jazz-driven decade that idolized athletes like Babe Ruth and Jack Dempsey and turned shy aviator Charles Lindbergh into an overnight celebrity. I don't know who coined the phrase the Roaring Twenties, but they really did roar. They roared with prosperity. They roared with a kind of hedonism. They roared with the adulation of the crowd for celebrities. And, of course, movie stars. When theater owner Marcus Lowe moved to production, acquiring Metro Pictures in 1920, his most valuable new asset wasn't a studio. It was access to the profitability of creative talent and star power. Metro writer-director June Mathis was an enthusiast for spiritualism. She claimed a sixth sense for talent. Her most famous find was Rodolfo, Alfonso, Raphael, Piero, Filiberto, Guglielmi, Di Valentina, D'Antangola. Rudolf Valentino, for me, is really a perfect emblematic movie star of the silent era. Because, first of all, he's not loaded with talent. Secondly, he doesn't come out of show business. He's just bumming around. He's cafe dancing here. He's possibly petty thieving here. He's drifting toward Hollywood. But June Mathis, who was a wonderful screenwriter, very successful screenwriter at Metro, had observed him. She was looking for someone to play the key role of Julio in Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And it occurred to her that he might be perfect, particularly since Julio does a great tango in the movie. He's fabulous in that tango. He stands up a nobody and sits down a star. Valentino became the male sex symbol of the 1920s. He thrilled women as the impulsive chic. With the power of the movies, his image was indelible. Valentino was an overnight star, but movie fame could also end with shifting public whim. Star power was tested when Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford fell in love. The problem was that both were married to other people, and in the 1920s, divorce was a social stigma. The two stars feared their union would end their careers. Instead, audiences were thrilled. Living at their hilltop mansion, Pickfair, in Beverly Hills, one of the first grand estates of the area, Pickford and Fairbanks were granted a reprieve by the fans. But morality watchdogs have been keeping an eye on the movie business since Nickelodeon days. That made image-conscious moguls wary, most of them eager to distance themselves from their peep show past, especially Louis B. Mayer. He was very moralistic, my grandfather, offended by the vulgarity of vaudeville and burlesque. From the time he was in the business as a young man, he talked about good movies, clean movies, movies for the family. He was very old fashioned in this sense. By 1920, moral uplift was in the air. The Volstead Act banned the sale of intoxicating liquor in the United States. But in Hollywood, for a young generation of movie makers flush with the power of money and fame, prohibition was a law made to be broken. Over Labor Day weekend in 1921, Hollywood Good Times visited San Francisco. A raucous party was held at the St. Francis Hotel. Bootleg liquor flowed freely. Hosting the boozy celebrations was popular comedy star 
Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. Before the San Francisco party was over, things turned ugly. Arbuckle was accused of forcing himself on 30-year-old Virginia Rappé, a little-known actress. Rappé later died from a ruptured bladder complicated by peritonitis. Fatty Arbuckle was charged with manslaughter in the death of Virginia Rappé in September of 1921, and that sent shockwaves through the industry. An ambitious San Francisco district attorney issued an indictment but even before Arbuckle faced a judge and jury, he was convicted in the press. Two hung juries resulted in yet a third trial. And in the third trial, he was acquitted with an apology from the jury. It was decided that Virginia Rappé had died from a pre-existing condition, nothing Arbuckle had done. But the verdict came too late. Once as famous as Charlie Chaplin, Arbuckle struggled to make a comeback, working as a director. Frustrated and disillusioned, he died at age 46. Looking back at the scandal, Arbuckle's friend, comedian Buster Keaton, declared, it was the day our laughter stopped. The second Arbuckle trial was still in session when Adolf Zucker faced another scandal in February 1922. Dapper Paramount director William Desmond Taylor was found shot to death. There were no clues to a killer, but plenty to suggest scandalous goings-on. It was thought that maybe he'd been involved in drug dealing, perhaps there was some homosexual connection, but certainly there was um, some sort of sexual relationship with two Hollywood stars of the period. Mary Miles Minter, and Mabel Norman. Pictured on screen as the image of virginal innocence, Mary Miles Minter's career was severely damaged when her gushing love notes were discovered in the murdered director's home. For Mabel Norman, her involvement in the unsolved mystery began a downward slide, hastened by alcohol and drugs, ending with her premature death in 1930 at age 37. Hollywood started getting this reputation of being this really sensual, sexual, terrible place. And that was keeping some people away from the movies somewhat. They realized that if they didn't do something pretty soon themselves, the government would step in and tell them what they could and couldn't do. And they didn't want that. So they decided to, you know, organize it themselves and start their own censorship board. Will Hayes was a professional politician. He had been the postmaster general in the Warren G. Harding administration. Hayes came up with a list of do's and don'ts through what was called the Studio Relations Office. The code sets up high standards of performance for motion picture producers. It states the considerations which good taste and community value make necessary in this universal form of entertainment. The establishment of the Hayes office fended off outside interference in the movie business, but even as they declared their dedication to high morality and family values, the moguls found ways to profit from audience tastes for the risque. Filmmakers found the way to do that was to give their audiences a lot of sex, a lot of fun, a lot of partying, a lot of drinking in a prohibition era, and then at the end, to have the good girl marry the good boy and live happily ever after in a, in a nice little chaste life. Cecil B. DeMille did this with his Sin and Salvation epics, where he could show a lot of sinning, a lot of sex, a lot of debauchery, because at the end, there was salvation for all concerned. In the 20s, Cecil B. DeMille was a master at toying with the do's and don'ts of the Hayes office as he played to the hilt the role of imperious movie maker. Having come a long way from the Squaw Man in 1914, DeMille proved more than his image. His use of light and shadow gave a visual elegance to his work. But the ideal of the all-powerful director 
first embodied by D.W. Griffith, was not invincible. DeMille overreached himself with the 1923 Paramount epic, The Ten Commandments, mixing a biblical setting with a modern counterpart. It wasn't about the orgies and the revealing costumes. The project was way over budget. In mogul-ruled Hollywood, that was a mortal sin. The Ten Commandments turned out to be a hit, but directors whose independence and artistic vision took risks with tight budgets were quickly going out of style. The movie business is a business unlike any other because it marries art and commerce, and they are fundamentally incompatible. Art or commerce, during the 1920s, money mattered more than ever. Major stars were making fortunes, but working with a studio contract meant they didn't have total control over the work, or more important, the profits. Always in the history of stardom and moguldom, there is the basic conflict. Who controls? Is it the star that the public wants to see, or is it the entrepreneur who creates the vehicle for the star so the public can see them? Four of the industry's most powerful creative talents, Mary Pickford, D.W. Griffith, Charlie Chaplin, and Douglas Fairbanks, decided to take things into their own hands. The result was a new distribution company, United Artists, founded in 1919. When he joined United Artists, D.W. Griffith was disappointed at the reception of his multi-layered epic Intolerance and still upset by the protests against the birth of a nation. Working from his estate and studio in Mamaroneck, near New York City, Griffith produced more conventional stories, such as Way Down East, a well-known melodrama, and Orphans of the Storm, set during the French Revolution. Both had memorable moments, but Griffith's determination to maintain artistic independence left him frustrated and deeply in debt. He turned to alcohol as his eminence continued to fade. Time and tastes were changing. Once unchallenged as the world's greatest filmmaker, now D.W. Griffith faced competition for the title, and not all of his challengers were directors. <laughs> 